Hello and welcome back. This is topic 1.4 where we're going to cover membrane transport. So here is all the understandings and everything IV expects you to know. So first things first, we have just the simple property of diffusion. What basically it says is if there's an area of like concentrated um, solute, what will happen is it'll spread out by just by random movement. And so the whole um, concentration across the whole liquid will eventually be the same. So basically, there's two types of diffusion. Um, we have simple diffusion and facilitated diffusion. Now what simple diffusion is, is basically, say we have a higher, a very high concentration of non-polar molecules outside of the cell. And then inside the cell, we have a very small amount. Basically what's gonna happen, just by random movement, these molecules are gonna move across the membrane from high concentration to low concentration. And basically what it's worth noting here is these particles have to be nonpolar because if they're too big or they're not nonpolar, they won't be able to cross over the membrane. Now this can kind of be overcome when we add um, proteins or these, um, these, and this becomes facilitated diffusion. So there's two main types of proteins. They're called channels, which is just like a pathway. And then we have carrier proteins, which will kind of change shape. So first with channels, um, one, example is aquaporin. Since water is a polar molecule, it can't cross, um, it can't go across the plasma membrane easily. So it can go through this channel and cross into the membrane. Basically, say there's a higher concentration of water out here and a very low concentration within the cell. This, um, this channel protein will allow the water to cross over because it creates an environment within this channel that allows for polar molecules to pass. At the same time, over here, say um, a molecule comes, this will change shape without the need of any energy, and it will be able to pass through. So that's pretty much everything for um, simple facilitated diffusion. Now another type of diffusion is osmosis, which is the diffusion of water. So if you have a membrane here that doesn't allow particles to move, what's going to happen is eventually through random movement, the water is going to move. So all you see all this, all the empty space, eventually this water will go over to try to make both sides of equal concentration. So it's worth noting while the water, um, the solute is kind of, this, the concentration is lowering in the higher concentration. What's happening with the water is that the water is moving from an area of high or low solute concentration to high solute concentration rather than from so basically what you can say is the water is moving against the solute concentration gradient but it's moving with the water concentration gradient because if you look at the concentration of water there's much less water in this area than in this area over here so in putting that um, property of uh, osmosis to use um, we can get osmolarity. So the main um, osmolarity is what we want to maintain is isotonic. So isotonic means that the concentration inside and outside of the cell will remain the same, or they are the same, I should say. And what this means is that there will be no net, there'll be zero net movement of water. The movement inside of the cell of water is the same as the movement outside of the cell of water. And it's worth noting what these particles do is that they kind of hold on to the water as well. So if we had, say, a hypotonic solution, which is a relatively um, low osmolarity and a low, um, so there's a low concentration with outside of the cell, say we have a very high concentration inside the cell. What's going to happen is by random movement, because this, these particles kind of prevent water from moving outside, this these and these particles don't prevent it as much water is going to move inside of the cell and it kind of makes sense because what the water is going to try to do is going to make the concentration equal so it's going to try to make this much less dis much more dispersed so it kind of matches the concentration outside of the cell and then for hypertonic it's just the opposite it's a very low relative concentration compared to the outside of the cell so basically the water is being kind of trapped in a sense by these molecules and the water is going to by random movement move outside of the cell in order to make the two concentrations equal. 
When kind of looking at the application here, we notice that if you place a cell in a hypotonic solution, what's going to happen is the water is going to enter the cell and it's going to create a much, um, it's going to increase the volume and eventually if it gets too big, it'll just um, burst. And this is known as lysis. On the other hand, if you place a cell in a hypertonic solution and the water starts to leave the cell, it's going to cause the volume to shrink and basically that's going to cause this look known as crenation, which is just kind of very wavy and shriveled. It's, when, you look, when you're looking with plants, however, it's a little different because of the cell wall. So when you have a cell or a plant cell placed in a hypotonic solution, water is still going to enter the cell, but it's going to create this thing known as plasmolysis. And basically, the cell is not going to burst, but it's just going to kind of put tension, pressure against the cell wall and kind of expand it a little bit. And then when we place a, a plant cell in a hypertonic solution, the water is the, um, water's still going to want to leave the cell, but because we have the cell wall, it's going to maintain its shape, and instead the cell membrane is just kind of kind of shrivel in this process of crenation. And this is known as turgor. So that's pretty much um, what happens when you place it in these different types of solutions. And this application is in the mainly in things such as the medical field. You're going to want a solution that's isotonic so the cells don't have any adverse effects. So then we move on to active transport. Active transport is the transport of um, molecules against their concentration gradient. And since it's from an area um, of low to high, rather than high to low, it's going to require energy. So this first part we have is these two over here are known as primary active transport. And this is because it's the use of ATP and both are going um, from high to low, or low to high, I should say, sorry. So basically say you have some molecules over here in a very low concentration gradient, and then you have the same molecules in the high concentration gradient over here. Let's always do the whole thing here. Now, if we want to move these molecules into the cell, they're not going to, it's not going to happen naturally. So in order to do this, what's going to happen is this membrane carrier, this protein carrier is going to use, utilize ATP, or I should write ATP, in order to change shape and then bring this all the way through. So that'll, that's basically the movement from low to high concentration against its concentration gradient. And when it uses ATP, this ATP is going to turn into adenosine diphosphate, ADP, and then there will be an extra phosphate, and the breaking of this bond is basically what gives it its energy. So in contra contransport, or sorry, I said that wrong, this is known, yeah, contransport, or cotransport, basically what's happening here is it's just two different molecules. So if I have this screen still over here, but instead now I also have, say, these pink ones in a very high, a very low concentration gradient over here in a very high outside of the cell. Basically what this uh, membrane protein will do is it'll utilize ATP to move both against their concentration gradients. So these green one, these green molecules will come in, these purple will go out, and ba but basically both what's happening here is ATP is moving them both against their concentration gradient. So now this, these two over here are known as secondary active transport because what's going to happen is one's going to move against their concentration gradient and another one is going to move with its concentration gradient. So in this example, say we have a very low concentration gradient of the purple molecules and a very high inside the cell. And then for these green molecules, we have a very we have a very low outside and a very high inside as well. What's going to happen is just naturally these purple molecules are going to move with their concentrated gradient through like say a protein channel and they're going to generate energy. Now this energy is going to allow for these green molecules to go against their concentration gradient. Now this opposite movement is what gives its name antiport. 
And if you can kind of guess, simpor is that they're just both going to move in the same direction. So say you have a very high concentration gradient of the, actually, let me, you have a very high, again, in the cell of the green molecules and very low, and you're wanting to move these low into the high. What you're going to need in the sim port is a very high magenta outside of the cell and a very low inside. And naturally, this movement of magenta through a protein channel will just generate energy needed for this sim port. So kind of here now we have a practice question. The diagram is a model of one type of movement across a membrane. So I guess you can take a moment to try and do it on yourself, by yourself. Okay, so what type of, what is the movement in this uh, membrane? Well, we have a molecule going from high to low, so you know it's not going to be active transport, especially since we don't see, it's not facilitating the movement of any other molecule against this concentration gradient. Now we notice that so it's going to be one of these three passive transports. Now, it's, now, simple diffusion is the movement just simply across the membrane. And since we have this protein channel, it's not going to be simple diffusion. And then osmosis is the same thing as simple, or simple diffusion, but more as water, is going to move across a membrane, not really through a, cha a protein channel. So that leaves us with B, facilitated diffusion. So IB expects us to know this is applied to a nerve cell. So basically in the nerve cells you have voltage gated pumps and you have these for both sodium and potassium. These are both ions by the way. And basically what will happen is originally you have a high a very high concentration gradient of one of these molecules and the nerve cell will always be at different voltages but basically say at a resting potential a low lower voltage this protein nerve channel, this um, channel will be closed and it'll just, so these won't be able to go anywhere, this, these won't be able to enter the cell as they naturally would. And once the voltage ri rises, this protein channel automatically opens up, allowing for this facilitated diffusion without energy into the cell. And then once it'll reach a certain limit, it, this protein will automatically close again without the use of energy and then no longer allow this molecule in. And then here we have sodium potassium pumps. Now this is your active diffusion in the nerve cell. So what will happen is this will try to move it against the concentration gradient. So the sodium will enter the cell and then you'll notice we'll have this use of ATP um, and then this sodium will be able to exit the cell and then potassium will come in and then this, this um, phosphate will unbind, allowing the, um, allowing the potassium to enter into the cell. And now what happens with this is basically it kind of restores the um, concentration gradients to a potential that allows um, the cell to function. And if you'll note, if it's not really depicted here, but for every three sodiums, two potassiums enter. Finally, there's endocyto or there's membrane transport, which involves the actual bending of the membrane. Say you have a large molecule that wants to enter the cell. What it'll do is it'll start to enter the cell, and as it continues to enter the cell, this membrane will basically essentially collapse on itself. And what that does is it allows for um, a molecule or anything the cell needs to enter the cell. Now there's two types. You can have the entering of solid, like a molecule here, or you can also have a liquid. The solid is known as phagocytosis, while the liquid is pinocytosis. As for leaving the cell, um, an example of this is um, proteins exiting the cell. The protein will be uh, made in the rough ER. It'll be put inside of a membrane. It'll go to the Golgi body, and then it'll be processed there, ready for um, transport. And then it'll start to go to the cell membrane and basically what happens here is it will attach and then it'll re this the membrane around the protein will rejoin with the cell membrane and eventually the molecule or the protein will be outside of the cell. 
So here's an example question. Which process is possible due to the fluidity of the cell membranes? Well, maybe endocytosis. This allows for the membrane to reconnect and disconnect. In osmosis is more just the ability of it to water to go across a membrane. And actually, water has a much harder time going across cell membranes than, say, um, an artificial membrane due to its polarity. Um, we have ATP production. That's not done within the membrane. And cell recognition, that's more of a protein known as glycoproteins on the cell membrane, so that leaves us with A, endocytosis. So now we have an example free response question here. So basically what you'll have to do here is you won't be able to select from a choice of answers. So first you have to state the name of organelle A. So now if you'll notice here, this is where the product, the end product is being produced. This is going to be the rough ER. And now these product is going and it's the most likely protein is going to come to this where the main the organelle we're trying to identify and then leave the cell. So this is going organelle A is going to be the Golgi body or the Golgi apparatus. And what that does is it basically packages proteins for use outside of the cell. And then we have to state, state the process occurring at B. Now if you'll just think, oh it's leaving the cell, you can excess cytosis, make sure you pay attention to the arrow. This is entering the cell. So this is going to be endocytosis. And then finally, it's going to ask, how does the structure of the membrane allow for the formation of vesicles? So here you want to discuss just the fluidity of the membrane and how the ability of phospholipids to easily move through, throughout the membrane allows um, vesicles, it allows something in order to come in and it allows this membrane to kind of collapse upon itself and reconnect much easier than if, it, um, if this membrane didn't have, didn't have this structure. And if you just kind of explain the fluidity and the ability of phospholipids to reconnect, um, that would get you all the points. And then here, outline the effects of putting plant tissue in a hypertonic solution. So first, you have to understand what the hypertonic solution is. A hypertonic solution is when we have a solution outside the cell with an extremely high concentration. So it's a very low concentration inside the cell. And basically what's going to happen is, is you have to describe first that the hypertonic solution is a solution that has more solutes than inside the cell. And then you can talk about how water will start leaving the cell through a process of osmosis. And the water moves from a lower solute concentration to a higher solute concentration. Make sure you don't say a higher concentration of water to a lower because that would require energy and that's not what's happening here. It's a low solute to a high solute concentration. Then you can say that this causes the pressure inside to drop as the volume decreases. And basically what's going to happen here is it's going to, it's going to become turgid and the cell is going to start um, shrinking. However, you know that the cytoplasm within the cell is going to decrease. So if you just sell, if you just say that the plant cell shrinks or shrivels, that's not in the case because this cell membrane still maintains its structure and the size of the cell remains the same. And then finally, describe four different types of transport of substances across the membrane. From here, you just need your passive, which is going to be simple. facilitated, or simple and facilitated diffusion, I should say, and then osmosis. And then you can talk about your active transport, which is requiring energy. You know, it's, worthy to, it's worthy to note, point out that these three do not require energy, while active transport does require energy. And then you can say these three go across from a high to a low concentration, and this one goes from a low to high concentration.